So in this video, we're going to actually learn the why part of this plugin. Why we would choose certain tape types or sizes or any of the other parameters that we have available for us. Tape machines have fascinated me ever since I saw one back in the late 80s after watching an Elvis documentary, of all things, that showed Sam Phillips using one. I thought there must be some sort of magic about it because hearing those recordings changed my life. So it's only natural to be drawn to the digital plug-in version of analog tape machines. Now, Sam used tape because that's what recordings were made on, but he also used it as an effect, which is really how we use it today since we record to computer software. We use it to add effects such as saturation, distortion, to smooth out harsh guitars or vocals. We can use it for tape delay echo, which Sam Phillips made famous by using two tape machines. Now, we just select a preset button. But what about its main purpose for existing in the first place? To record with, recreating that analog warmth that tape gave us, you know, the part that's missing from digital recording. How can we use it in our DAWs like that? Well, first we have to understand how tape machines work and why certain elements are chosen for certain recordings. And that's what this video is all about. Tape emulation plugins can come close to recreating the vibe and characteristics of real vintage tape machines. But in order to understand the differences between these units, you've got to know what they're emulating before choosing those certain elements. If you were using an actual analog tape machine to record with, you would first have to calibrate the machine to whatever tape you were using. With digital tape machines like the UAD ATR-102, everything is calibrated for you no matter which tape you select. But knowing how tape calibration works will help us understand why we choose certain things like tape type, speed, size, and whatever else options they give us. Let's take a look at that. This is a hardware emulation plugin that has got a lot of different options for us to choose from. Now that's a lot of buttons. And I feel like nowadays we kind of just overlook everything or we go to those YouTube videos. The ones that click on every single button doesn't really explain a whole lot to us. So in this video, we're gonna actually learn the why part of this plugin, why we would choose certain tape types or sizes or any of the other parameters that we have available for us. So to start things off, let's learn how this machine calibrates itself and how you could do that manually. So you've got something up here called auto calibration, auto cal, and you can click that to off or you can have the machine do it itself. But right now we're gonna go with off because I wanna teach you a couple of things about this plugin. But one cool thing that you've got here is this little switch called MRL. And MRL stands for Magnetic Reference Laboratory that came with your tape machine. And in order to calibrate those tape machines, you had to keep up with your MRL tape. So you would put that on, it would look something like this, and you would run it through and pick up tones. Now there would be different tones. I'm not sure if all of these tones were included with your MRL tapes, but I do know that you would calibrate with 1K and 10K. And so we're going to see what that's like. Now I've got this in mute, but I'll unmute it just so that you can actually hear what's happening. So let's go ahead and click that all the way over. As you can see, we've got signal and here's what the 1K signal sounds like pretty annoying. So that's why I've got that in mute. So in order to calibrate these different tape types, you had to put in your MRL tape. And a lot of times you would start with 1K signal there. And then the way that you would calibrate this is that by having this off, you'll see that there's no signal here. Once I turn it on, we're hitting right about zero. So that tells me that all of these parameters are already calibrated because we had it in our on there. But now we're in off and I wanna play around with, with some things here just to show you what is all going on. So right now we're in 15 ips, that is inches per second. So there's 15 inches per second. Now the, one of the reasons that this was so desirable is because it was a slower tape speed and it was able to collect a lot of that low end frequency just a little bit better 
had a lot of nice warmth in that. And I'm going to show you how you can really tell that there is a little bit of a low end boost in these tape machines. So right now we're in repro mode and that is the reproduction. That is the output of what you're hearing that has already gone through the tape and then out. So right now we've got a signal at 1K, but I want to see what's happening if I use a signal around 50 Hertz. So you see how the meter boosted a little bit. I'll show you that again. We'll go back to 1K and watch the meter here when I go to a 50 hertz tone. It's a little bit of a bump. So that's where we're getting a lot of that nice low end. Now, the next thing that we can kind of look at is the 456 tape. So now we're in 15 oops. And we've kind of, we've still got a little bit of a low end boost there. But let's go back to 1K. So 1K on the 456 tape we are pretty on spot in the zero. We are definitely calibrated. But let's see what happens when we go up to 30. So there's just a tad little bit of a boost with 30 inches per second for our speed. But let's see what 10K does. Whoa. So it's quite a bit of top end coming in on the 10K here. So what if we pre, we go ahead and auto calibrate that? What is it gonna do? Is it gonna change anything? This goes back to zero. So let's see what, what was going on there. So you see how we can make some changes and if something's off, if we're not calibrated, you could go ahead and hit the auto calibrated option here and it will reset all of those to calibrate it for you. But if you wanted to do something on your own here, so Let's go back to our 250 tape and we'll go to, we'll just go to our 50 Hertz here. And this could be any of them, if any of them were off. So what you could do is since we're in repro mode here, we can find repro over here and we can calibrate that ourselves. So we're in the lower frequencies, so we can adjust the low frequency, repro LF, low frequencies. So this is going to adjust our VU meter here and if we wanted to calibrate that to zero, we could do that. We have the option to do that. However, I don't want to because we like that low end boost on those parameters. But that's how you can change some of these up. So let's go back to the 456 tape. See how we're like really hot on 10K here? Now watch all of the controls here and see how they snap into place to calibrate once I hit auto calibrate. So our repro high needed to come down some. And so that gives you an idea how the calibration works, why it's doing certain things and what it's doing it for. And we can take that information and we know not just from hearing it, but we can know up front, should, do we want to have it in 15 ips? Do we want to have it in 30 ips? Do we want to use the 250 tape? Do we want to use the 456? And we'll get to the tape size in just a minute. The next thing that I want to go over is the emphasis EQ here. Now let's explain this thoroughly because it is important to know how these two settings will affect the overall tone and characteristic of your sound. Now essentially it is an EQ curve that happens when using 15 ips and lower. As you can see we are in 30 ips at the moment and neither one of them can be selected. So let's go down to 15 and you see how now we are able to select these. That's because the US market had a standard while the European market had another approach to the 15 ips curve to basically eliminate tape hiss by altering the 10K shelf that was being recorded. The 10K curve was decreased on the record end and then re-emphasized on playback. So that ultimately there is a flat curve in the playback while getting rid of tape hiss on the recording side. So we can take a look at this and see how those EQ areas are altered by testing the MRL tone at 10K and then switching back and forth between the CCIR and the NAB. Let's take our 
auto calibration off so that we can see what the differences are. So right now we are in the NAB at a 10K signal tone. So let's switch to the CCIR and see if anything happens up here on our meters. So there's the boost in the 10K on the CCIR side. But if we wanted to have the inner workings and the calibration going, all we have to do is hit on and it comes back down in the repro, the playback after the recorded sound. So now they both should be working as calibrated. But that just goes to show you the difference of where that's happening. So the 10K is being de-emphasized. It's being taken out to reduce his sound. And then on the, repro, on the repro side, on the playback, it's adding it back in. So that's why it's at zero. And then when we go to the CCIR, without it being calibrated, it was a boost. But once we calibrate that, it's taken out. So you can see these move here. I'll show that again, the boost. Now watch what changes here to calibrate it, to, to take back that 10K boost. The high shelf on the record end is pulled back down. So that gives you an idea of how the different EQ curves work, why they were made. They were basically noise reduction systems with the CCIR giving you the option of simply making it less noisy at 15 ips and how you can go into your auto calibration to see what is actually happening what what is actually happening to bring that back to zero okay so the last thing that i want to talk about is the tape size the choice of tape size significantly impacts the overall sound therefore it's crucial to comprehend the distinct sonic characteristics associated with each tape size and leverage this knowledge to make informed decisions tailored to your specific application. As recording technology advanced and multi-track tape machines grew to accommodate more and more tracks, tape size had become larger to hold multiple tracks. You also have to factor in the recorded source. Low-end audio, such as bass guitar, has wider wavelengths and they take up more space when being captured to tape. So using a one inch or a two inch tape can produce a clearer sound if you are recording multiple tracks. For sessions with fewer tracks or even a master print, you would consider a more narrow tape choice like half inch or even quarter inch. Now, of course, this really only applies to actual analog tape, but the sonic characteristics of tape size is translated into these digital plugins. Now, if you're familiar with my audio engineering workflow, you'd know that I like to adapt an analog approach to work completely inside of a DAW. This is what helps me understand how to make correct decisions when using hardware emulation plugins and tape machine plugins are no different. Here's a few applications of how I like to set up my session using tape. So as you can see, I've got this ATR 102 that has the options of going down to half inch and quarter inch on a pretend mix bus or stereo out here. So from that information, how I can use that in my decisions is that if I am wanting to put tape on all of my tracks, I may go ahead and just use the one inch tape because I'm using it kind of how it would be recommended to use a bigger size tape to hold more information if you're recording multiple tracks. And so I'm taking the knowledge of how you would use an actual analog tape machine. So I might put a one inch 250 over all of my tracks that I'm recording and then on my mix bus or my two out, wherever I'm wanting that last tape to go, I'll probably switch that back over to half inch or even quarter inch, whatever's gonna sound the best because that is all I need to hold. So once it's being summed down through your console and then back to a master print or a mix print, I just need the two tracks, stereo left and stereo right. So I would choose a smaller tape than I would to record that information on. 
And so we're just taking that, that analog console or that analog tape machine information and we're just applying it of how it would work in a DAW. Now, does it really matter? I mean, you know, plugins are designed to have an optimal sound go through them, but do we have to worry about size in recording in digital? No, but I still want to be able to use these emulation plugins how I would if they were analog. I'm just adapting that workflow inside of a DAW. So let's take a look at some different tape machine plugins just in case you don't have this one or anyone with an MRL signal generator. So what we could do is take our own signal generator here and send that to our plugins so that we can test out all of these things that we've been talking about. And one thing to keep in mind is you'll need to go ahead and put your signal generator at a 12 dB tone because this MRL is being sent at 12 dBs. And so let's take a look at that. We've got this now at a thousand hertz. And, and really, you know, back when you were and calibrating your own machines, the signals were gonna be 1K and 10K. Um, I'm not even sure that there were all of these other ones, but it's just nice to have those just to see what's happening at those frequencies with this tape machine. But I'm just going to use the 1000 and then 10K to test these out. So at 250, at 30, so let's go back to, to 50 here. And now we make sure that we're in our, our auto calibration is turned off so that we can kind of control these ourselves. And so let's just send a signal and watch our meters here, okay? So pretty much at zero. Now let's see what happens when we go to 10K. It kind of looks like we're under a little bit, right? So what we could do is just go up to our repro because we're in repro and we're high frequency and we can just change it up a little bit. Oh, just barely moved it a little bit. So now we're exactly at zero. But let's see what some other tape is. All right, there, like I said, on uh, some of these tapes, there's a little bit of a de-emphasis at 10K because it was taking out hiss. Now if we put this in 30, now we're way up because it's faster. We're getting a cleaner information up top. So we might want to see what happens when we hit the auto calibrate. Now pay attention to these right here. So they all moved, right? So now we're back at zero. And you can go through all of these. And you see how it kind of moves and then moves back to zero? Because we're in auto calibrate. So let's check out that 50 hertz. And we've got quite a bit of a boost on this. So even with this style of tape machine, we've got quite a bit more boost at 50 hertz. So we know what this tape machine is doing and we know what that 250 is doing at 15 ips. So let's try something different here. Let's try the 900 tape. So different ips is emphasizing different things. If we go to the 7.5 ips, we're getting closer back to zero. And I think it's recommended to have a plus nine on that. So check this out. So it's a little bit off, but when we go to plus nine, the calibration takes us back to zero. So at zero, that's where their zero calibration is with these numbers. Same thing with the GP9 at 30 ips, so quite, a, quite hot there. One other thing that you would calibrate on a tape machine is the record side, what's going in. So... Maybe we have to adjust the input here because auto calibration is obviously not doing that. So if we pull back on the input just a little bit, we're now calibrated at zero. So those are some things that you can keep in mind. If we were at 15 ips, we could push that back up to zero. Now it is according to whatever audio you're putting through there, but at these levels, you can know how to calibrate these tape emulation plugins. And by knowing these things, you're able to understand why you would choose certain things. So 
to recap, what have we learned? We've learned that there is a little bit of a 50 hertz boost in these tape machine plugins, which is great because that's kind of what tape machines were doing. They were also doing a lot of compression and things like that. And I feel like, you know, tape compression, tape saturation, the uh, tape delay effects that some of them have, we've kind of we've, we we kind of already know that stuff, but these are the things that never get talked about on understanding why you make certain decisions, why you pick certain things, why you pick, you know, speeds, different types, different sizes. And so I just wanted to go over that a little bit and show you how you can test these out and not just go through every single button, but actually understand how these tape machines are designed to work and understand your choices a little bit better. Because, you know, these tape machine plugins serve as a bridge between the nostalgia of vintage recording techniques and the convenience of modern digital workflows. They not only allow us to recreate the sonic qualities of analog tape, but also offer a plethora of effects and processing capabilities that once were exclusive to these physical tape machines. Understanding the inner workings of tape machines is essential for harnessing their full potential within our DAWs. From calibration to tape size selection, each element plays a crucial role in shaping the final sound. And by getting into the nuances of tape emulation, we can breathe some life back into our digital recordings by infusing them with the warmth and depth and character reminiscent of classic analog recordings. So the next time that you fire up your DAW, consider incorporating these tape machine plugins into your workflow. Embrace the essence of analog recording in a digital landscape. Elevate your productions to new heights and embark on a sonic journey that transcends the confines and time of technology. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you learned something. If you did, please go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. And if this is something that you might want to continue learning about and learning different techniques in recording and mixing, then make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you can see all the past videos and be sure that you don't miss in seeing any of the new ones that I put out. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for watching. I will see y'all on the next one.